UTO, the most powerful group in terms of balancing out what the EU and the US ask for has been the BRICS. Um, I'm not advocating for Putin or for, you know, or, or any sort of a supporter for the, the kind of approach to human rights that they've been taking, absolutely not. But it's, it's about who gets to decide on a world stage. Um, and, and ideally, I think you would be taking into account the needs of the majority of the world rather than just two small trading blocks who have very particular interests and who have very strong uh, kind of um, um, strong sectors that they're seeking to protect in terms of this trade deal. Um, we'll call a uh, halt there. I'd, I'd like to thank Ruth for um, a passionate presentation and I think you've done a very good job of highlighting the issues of um, <coughs> countries, developing countries. So thank you very much. Ruth. <laughs> Um, it's a special uh, privilege uh, next to uh, to invite our, our keynote speaker to the, the podium to the uh, lectern. The, the, wor the world of environmental law is quite a small one. You know, there are a number of people who are sub specialists in the area, and I've, I've met most of them uh, over the years, but I've never had the privilege of. Um, Recognize uh, a meeting Professor Augustus Sadler, but I, I feel I kind of know him through some of his really important publications. There's a, uh, a weighty text on uh, EU environmental principles, which is compulsory reading for all my postgraduate students, and there's a more recent work on trade in the EU. So we really are uh, very privileged to have one of the leading lights in the European environmental law world speak to us today and I'm sure he can uh, draw some penetrating and Im important insights from his extensive knowledge of EU trade law. If you want to use the, the lectern please do. Please do. Thank you. Sorry, I should have added the, uh, the information about your affiliations. Oh. Yes, uh, UCL is uh, not University uh, College London, it's uh, Université Catholique de Louvain, uh, also among one of the oldest uh, universities on this continent. Um, well, it's a great pleasure uh, to speak for the second time um, to this audience. I was invited already two years ago, uh, but my uh, a speech focused on the six-pack and the forthcoming two-pack and the uh, austerity measures uh, entailed uh, by this uh, broad range of um, uh, regulations. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, not only the ministries of culture of uh, Italy and Greece were hit uh, by the um, uh, austerity uh, flowing from uh, the, the need to stabilize uh, national deficit and national budget, but uh, as a matter of fact also ministries uh, of uh, environmental protection have been suffering quite a lot uh, in losing their budget or in curtailing their budget and their number of civil servants. And actually what we do see all across Europe from west to east, from north to south, uh, is that um, environmental ministries are far less efficient than they used to be ten years ago uh, on the account that they are not endowed with the same level of resources. Uh, I shall um, address the trade uh, and the environmental debate uh, from an EU perspective, but uh, listening to the former uh, speaker, I will try to reconnect uh, my uh, speech to former comments. Um, of importance is to stress that uh, at the outset, uh, in 1957, um, the uh, issue of environment protection or the issue of uh, health or food safety uh, were absent from the former treaty on the European economic communities. Uh, through a number of reforms, <laughs> environmental concerns, as well as a number of other concerns, have gradually been able to establish themselves as key par parameters, as key values 
uh, enshrined into the constitutions of the EU. So, and so forth, uh, in virtue of Article 3, Paragraph 3 of the Treaty on the European Union, um, environmental protection um, is placed upon equal footing with the internal market. Uh, sustainable development has been set forth uh, and sustainable development entails a balanced economic growth with a high level of environment protection and also social uh, integration. And this is the basis uh, of the whole uh, legal order uh, that prevails over 28 national legal orders. Besides that, and that's one of the key differences with World Trade Organization legal system as well as the forthcoming TTIP, is that the success of the EU in half a century has been reckoning upon the ability, the empowerment of a broad range of institutions to enact harmonized legislations. So EU won't be looked at from an African or South American perspective as a success story in case it was not endowed with that ability to enact secondary legislations. And so, um, so far, uh, uh, EU environmental law uh, succeeded in encompassing the main forms, not all forms of pollution, and to maintain and to protect as well um, a number of key ecosystems, but not all uh, ecosystems. Um, that policy, and as well as environmental law, because that policy has been framed ever since uh, into a legal approach, uh, yielded to a number of successes, ranging from the banning of lead uh, in petroleum products, uh, phasing out at a much um, faster speed uh, ozone depleting substances than uh, the speed with which they have been uh, banned uh, on uh, in uh, other continents. Uh, limitation from na nitrogen oxides, um, really uh, improvement of waste water treatment all across the continent, a reduction of acidification that was a very severe problem in the early 70s. Establishment of natural tools on network that really been enhancing nature protection all across the continent, and also improvement of parts of some aspects of air quality. But well, that's also one of the contradiction of this environmental policy that's also uh, uh, prompting uh, the development of new energy uh, that can be placed in uh, virgin uh, land that are uh, of uh, interest uh, for bird species. This is close to Teruel uh, in uh, Navarra in Spain, um, prime hotspots for a number of uh, endangered uh, steppe species. So one clearly understands also the contradiction to uh, enhance uh, such uh, environmental approach. But that being said, the omens are unfortunately not that too good. Uh, the EU is still facing a daunting agenda of unfinished business. Uh, many of the European Commission reports so far have been stressing that uh, the objectives regarding waste management, regarding the diminution of hazardous substances into waters, uh, bios biodiversity conservation targets, have not been achieved and are not going to be achieved in the very near future. Um, in addition to this, uh, European cities um, last 10 days ago have been struggling with a very high level of refined particles pollution. That was the case uh, of uh, the capital of Belgium, Brussels, uh, where we reach uh, 80 um, microgram of um, uh, fine particles uh, for a day without the public being apprised of the matter. What a shame. But uh, adding to this, we do face extremely serious uh, challenges with respect in particular to climate change. Um, I've been spending the last few days to look at the different uh, IPCC reports and the, we face an accumulation of evidence. The evidence is strengthening, not regarding exclusively the cause and uh, effect relationship between the emissions of greenhouse gases, but also regarding 
the cascade of impacts uh, the rise of temperature uh, might uh, entail. And so, uh, as you're aware, the uh, EU uh, targets that were uh, endorsed by the European Council in Brussels uh, last uh, September are uh, falling short uh, of uh, meeting a high level of um, climate change uh, policy objectives, according to many scientists. It's not enough. Uh, but nonetheless, it's much better than the American objectives that were proposed a week ago, uh, where the benchmark is not the year 1990, but the benchmark is the year 2005. Why 2005? Because that's where the US hit it, the highest level of emissions of greenhouse gases in their history. So that means that in achieving a 30% reduction against the 2005 benchmark, that means that Americans have to commit, or American companies will have to commit far less than European undertakings. But the question is free trade the issue, and, and I, I concurred with the <coughs> opinion of uh, Mr. Uh, Stoll uh, that it depends what kind of trade, what, what are we trading in, uh, what kind of uh, economy we try to uh, foster. Uh, economic growth at all costs, and everybody is aware of that in London at least, uh, is resulting in greater pressures on ecosystems. So plenty of scientific studies demonstrating that a higher exploitation of natural resources, higher consumption of services and products is actually leading to the deteriorations of a key ecosystems. But coming to the EU, one has to bear in mind that the EU business has never been to afford a high level of environmental protection or high level of health protection. The EU DNA is about economic integration, full stop. EU is reckoning upon an internal market, person to Article 26 of the Treaty on Functioning of the European Union, that foster four key freedoms, as well as the freedom of establishment, and uh, that uh, try to uh, enhance an, an economy uh, where there are no distortions of competition. So that's the, the key, uh, the, 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 the key uh, paradigm uh, of the uh, EU history. And so, so, so sorry to be a little bit simplistic, but we do face opposite objectives looking at the internal market on the one hand and the environmental policy. On environmental policy is about uh, protecting, conserving a vulnerable population, vulnerable uh, ecosystem, vulnerable resource through regulations. So in environmental policy has to go hand in hand with a regulatory approach. There is no genuine environmental policy without bans, without restrictions, without authorization schemes, without uh, sanctions, uh, without fines, fees, charge, and so on and so forth. Whereas the internal market is fostering trade flows through the regulations of national obstacles. So we do face a contradiction. Uh, under the internal market, the European Commission is vested with tremendous powers regarding notification of national measures departing from the internal markets. We got a system that's quite kind of close of the TBT World Trade Organization agreement that's reflected in under Directive 9843 that obliged the member states to notify every kind of regulatory measure that's likely to hinder free trading goods to the DG internal market of the European Commission. And that can also have a deterrent effect upon the willingness of some member states to endorse an original uh, regulatory approach. And all environmental lawyers are aware that the failure of environmental law is partly related to the unwillingness, to the absence of a clear uh, control policy, a problem that's compounded by the unwillingness of the European Commission to bring more member states to the Court of Justice for failing in achieving their objectives, for failing in implementing correctly uh, 
wide number of directives and so on and so forth. So we, we, we got a David and a Goliath in the picture. And that's clear. In Brussels, uh, the key civil servants of the European Commission are not the ones from DG Environment. If they want to make a career in Brussels, they are not going to stay for long in DG Climate or in DG Environment. They need to move to DG Agriculture, DG Competition, DG Industries. That's where people make their career, unfortunately. So that means that things are still fairly imbalanced as a matter of policy, as a matter of administration, as a matter of law. So is there really a clash? Well, if, uh, to, to, to look at all the documents produced so far by the European Commission regarding the TTIP, I imagine there is a clash because it's about removing not only tariffs, but mostly because uh, clearly it was stated there's the tariff issues is not an issue, but it's kind of d different regulatory approach. So there are different sets of regulations from one member state to another member state, from the EU to the USA. And so many uh, trade lawyers look at these discrepancies as um, hiding uh, neo-protectionist uh, policies. And so uh, the environmental law has been looked at continuously for 40 years as a possibility to reinforce the competitiveness of the domestic products as well as the competitiveness of the domestic undertakings. And that means that there must be a clash somewhere. But is the relationship completely unbalanced from an EU perspective? Well, it depends upon which side of the telescope one peers into, uh, through into the issue. Um, from a theoretical side, one could reach a conclusion that the EU system is much more perfect than the uh, classical uh, trade uh, legal regimes on the account that it combines a negative harmonization process under which a number of key provisions prohibit member states to uh, create obstacles to freedom of trading in capitals, of trading in goods, of trading, of moving persons from one country to another, of uh, um, establishing taxes, uh, discriminating foreign products, or establishing tax schemes uh, impeding the establishment of foreign companies uh, in the country. So that's the classical GATT or WTO approaches. It's prohibiting a state to do that and that and that. But the originality of this system is to add a positive layer in enacting regulations, decisions, and directives that constitute a common ground for companies. So companies have to, to, to abide by the standards laid down under these hundreds of regulations in order to trade freely in their products. So each of these pieces of legislation is providing for mutual recognitions. So whenever the products or the service complies with the standards laid on, uh, usually by the Commission under executive powers, um, they, they can be traded uh, freely across. Uh, 31 countries, the 28 member states, and the three after member states. And so, be it fuels, be it cars, be it airplanes, be it mo vehicle motors, be it tractors, be it chemicals, be it uh, insecticides, biocides, GMOs, all these regulations are part not of the health policy, neither of the health policy nor the environmental policy, but the genuine, pa genuine part of the establishment of the internal market. And so in exercising these powers, the EU institutions uh, provide for a precise legal framework limiting member states' ability to enact their own standards. So we, uh, thanks to this uh, internal market strategy, uh, greater legal certainty uh, has been 
offered to companies uh, than a tangible adjudic sorry, that's difficult, adjudicatory approach endorsed by the Court of Justice of the uh, European Union. And of course, that doesn't mean that there is no conflict, that there is no contradiction between uh, different sets of rules. So a, a good case in point, uh, in explaining to my students the, the conflict in, in regarding reuse and regarding uh, recycling of uh, water bottles. Uh, you're aware that the Belgium has the been achieving the highest uh, thresholds of uh, recycling uh, packaging on the planet. So at least we've been succeeding something in my country. <laughs> in addition to the uh, 502 days of uh, governmental crisis, uh, this, the obligation for uh, companies like uh, Sparen or like uh, Vitel or San Peregrino to, uh, bottle, um, to fill their bottles at the source that actually oblige companies to, uh, to choose uh, rather plastic bottles instead of um, uh, glass bottles on the account that it's uh, easier to move, to transport plastic bottles from uh, Spain to Belgium or from uh, uh, Germany, uh, southern Germany to the Netherlands. And uh, that enters into conflict with the packaging and waste packaging directives uh, that allows the member states uh, to develop their own packaging waste uh, schemes. And so uh, the, the two judgments mentioned here are, are, are really a, a case in point in highlighting the difficulties for the Court of Justice to strike a balance between uh, the obligations for traders to fill their bottles at the source, and that's really um, forcing them to uh, choose one sort of packaging that's not the best from an environmental perspective and the ability under this directive for member states to endorse their own policies. So, in spite of all this, uh, environmental production level do differ, uh, be it with water quality, be it with uh, nature conservation. Uh, there are no good pupils. Uh, in the class. I, I know that many of you journalists in the UK have been quite critical toward the last government uh, elections in three weeks and uh, I don't know what's the importance of the environmental issues in the next election uh, but uh, reading the British press I understood that um, several journalists were not uh, agreeing with the ways in which uh, David Cameron has been conducting or his government has been conducting uh, an environmental policy. So apparently the UK has become quite a bad pupil in the classroom. But unfortunately, the UK is not the only bad pupil. So we, we do face a very different standards, environmental standards, uh, outweigh the scope of the harmonization of products. And so that means that all these discrepancies exist. And so we move back to square one with negative harmonization. So, and that's whether national measures um, implying authorization schemes, uh, restrictions, fines, charges, and are consistent with the obligations laid on under the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. So, a classical example is the uh, obligation uh, for member states to uh, avoid uh, any quantitative restrictions whatsoever or any measures having an equivalent effect to quantitative restrictions, prohibitions that balance uh, with a clause that's uh, similar to uh, Article 20 of the GATT 1947-1994 uh, 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 agreements that uh, provides for a broad range of uh, exemptions uh, ranging from uh, public moral to uh, safety of um, human beings and uh, plants and animals. And so that's kind of classical uh, exercise that courts have to apply in reviewing national measures amounting to a measure having an equivalent effect. But in so doing, of course, in reviewing the national measures, there's always an economic issue. Is that whenever the member state is pursuing 
a moral objective or the uh, protection of historical monuments or the protection of uh, animal or plant health, they must not pursue an economic aim. Any economic aim, be it ancillary to the key objective, has to be rejected by the national courts. So expressing general interest, these uh, exemptions indicate a supremacy of non-commercial values over free movement of goods. But the problem is that your way waste management is about a forthcoming circular economy. So to draw the dividing line between a genuine environmental measures and ancillary, ancillary uh, economic goals uh, is uh, a rather uh, difficult uh, exercise. Well, to, to, to give you another example is the, the difficulties national civil servants and national administration do face with respect to these articles 34 and 35. So in Dassonville, the Court of Justice in 1974 handed a landmark judgment in explaining the member state that all trading rules capable of hindering directly, indirectly, actually, potentially, uh, free trade, free flows are contrary to Article 34, full stop. And then, what's the case I referred uh, that was adjudicated in the early 80s in Cassis de Dijon? It was a whiskey coming from the UK exported to. Uh, no, no, it was uh, the Cassis de Dijon exported uh, from France to. That's um, only about a whiskey, so it's always about alcohol. <laughs> uh, then, that's the recognition of mutual recognitions. Uh, Article 34 applies also to uh, measures applicable without uh, recognition. So the, the court has been trying to strike a balance between, firstly, uh, the ability for traders to place on the internal market their goods whenever they comply with one set of regulations of one member state. So the fact of complying with uh, French regulations opens the doors of the whole internal market, but that's counterbalanced with the possibility for the member states to apply a rule of reasons uh, in justifying the proportionality of their measures. So that was not too easy to explain to civil servants as an advisor to political bodies. But things got more complex with a Swedish case known as traders decided about a few years ago where the court is, took the view that a prohibition of all use of a product can amount to a measure having equivalent effect within the meaning of Article 34. So formally, Cassis de Dijon and Tassi and Dassonville were about laying down standards, product standards. So the, the, the amount of chemicals uh, in your coffee or in your milk, the amount of uh, flavoring uh, in that beverage and so on and so forth. The dimension of the computer or of your cell phone. Here we are moving much further. It's about using a product. Well, environmental law, administrative law, it's about regulating the use of, uh, of weapons or the use of uh, trucks and the use of tractors and the use of a number of equipment. So as a result, that means that all these kind of genuine environmental regulations, often local regulations, are likely to fall within the scope of ambit of the free movement of goods. And that makes the life of some civil servants rather complex. Because nowadays, they will have to contemplate different scenarios, whether uh, their policies are leading to uh, differentiated product requirements, that will be illegal. But on the side of selling arrangements, whenever there is no harmonization regarding selling arrangements, there is a presumption of legality, inasmuch as there is no discrimination regarding the traders and regarding the products at issue. And now uh, there is a new layer to, uh, to add to that is the restrictions on use where the national court will have to assess the impact of the domestic regulations upon the willingness of the consumer to purchase or not 
the product, the foreign product at issue. The kind of complex scenario for local, regional, national administrations trying to um, uh, solve um, problems related ranging from uh, fishing to hunting to uh, regulating uh, the entry of cars in um, overcrowded city and over polluted cities, how to cope with this. So the, the borderline is somewhat extremely complex between uh, negative harmonizations and positive harmonization. More and more cases adjudicated by the Court of Justice are touching upon the two issues. So the Court of Justice has to analyze whether there is a directive covering the whole field or whether there's still some room for maneuver in applying <coughs> Article 34, 36. But it reflects upon the forthcoming TTIP. This is already a fairly complex legal system. World Trade Organization, as far as I'm concerned, is extremely complex. I just add a new legal order on the top of that. With, of course, principle of mutual recognitions that's proposed by the European Commission in two chapters, and that's on DG Trade website, a chapter on SPS measures, and the a chapter on TBT measures. So, when it's also left in the dark regarding a broad range of questions, in particular with respect to extraterritorial dimensions, a validity of eco taxes, uh, how to uh, adumbrate this issue of uh, regulating the use of products, um, there are a number of cases uh, regarding. Uh, trucks, uh, so directives on air pollution are exceeded because there are too many trucks on highways. So our member states can regulate in not uh, hampering the principle of free movement of trucks within the internal market. Uh, time and again, it's uh, how to square the circle. So the, the question is how to move forward uh, from a legal perspective. Well, that's what I've been trying to do in different of uh, my different writing and trying to propose um, how to flesh out uh, environmental concerns person to Article 11 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union uh, into internal market issues. And to say, okay, look at taxes, look at eco taxes. One cannot um, adumbrate the same classical approach than 50 years ago in trying to uh, encompass really a broad range of products according to traditional consumer taste. Uh, I imagine that the taste of consumers in Birmingham are somewhat different than the ones of the students attending this classroom. Am I right? Or perhaps? Oh, yeah, okay, I'm right. So th 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 that means that the, the world has become more complex than 50 years ago as a matter of uh, taste, as a matter of access to, to products. And so Ecotaxation must be uh, assessed through uh, other uh, eyes than uh, the traditional case law. Um, uh, another issue for member states is that uh, the fact that they, whenever they face practical difficulties in trying to differentiate the different taxes or charges imposed upon foreign products, they cannot do that because they do discriminate. So the court is refusing to take into consideration practical issues, practical difficulties, but with public, la fonction publique, or, or, or does one say that in uh, English, or the, the public function shrinking, how can resolve this? Because, of course, with lesser and lesser amount of civil servants, it's more difficult to, uh, to differentiate, uh, to have very complex uh, tax schemes in, different, in, 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 in taking the view that there are uh, 25 different rates according to the level of uh, pollutants in each product. So uh, use of products, um, I'm sharing the same view that Gerd Winter in Bremen, uh, the court went too far, uh, really too far. But looking at the chapter uh, proposed by the European Commission, uh, at least the TBT chapter is also touching upon the use of product. So that can have a deterrent effect also 
uh, not only with respect to setting out standards on uh, placing on market of a specific product, but also later on, on regulating the ways in which the product is being used or is being consumed. And extraterritorial uh, scope, uh, be it with respect to World Trade Organization or be it with respect to EU law, uh, there are still plenty of room to uh, write essays, students' essays, PhDs, uh, even books on the subject matter. Um, the courts did not succeed to uh, clear their throat so far. Um, so, my, my regarding principle of proportionality, my view is that, uh, and I, I've seen kind of the, the Court of Justice in Luxembourg moving toward that, uh, starting to take into account much more seriously the availability of the different alternatives. So, of course, there are plenty of alternatives, but some of these alternatives are bloody expensive for the administration, others are much cheaper. Some are very efficient, others are negatory. And so nowadays the Court of Justice is trying to move from a very classical approach and saying always, okay, you get an alternative, let's quash your measure because it's nonsense, into a much more balanced approach. So that means that reading in between the lines, between the lines, one realized that uh, there is more uh, interest. And the, the two judgments on uh, renewable energy, uh, Orleans Wincroft and uh, SN Belgium, you got comments on my uh, website in English on um, Orleans Wincroft. Um, it's really, we see the court moving much further than ever in acknowledging uh, regional uh, or national Swedish schemes and uh, Flemish regional schemes prohibiting the taking into consideration of foreign certificates into the amount or into the thresholds of the green energy that uh, we deem to, to produce. And that's, frankly speaking, that system was uh, incompatible with the free movement of goods. Nonetheless, the Court of Justice took the view that given that the subject matter was harmonized, the member states could actually block the um, free circulations of these green certificates uh, with a view to uh, enhancing um, uh, the, the, the boosting of uh, green electricity productions in the country. But uh, as it was stressed time and again, uh, the challenges are ahead with this uh, obsession of uh, cutting red tape. Uh, I was amazed to, to, to look at the picture of the website of the former uh, secretary of the, uh, for the UK of, uh, for the environment. Uh, it's, it's really bordering. It's, it's, it doesn't belong to law anymore. It belongs to psychiatry, I imagine, because it's just... It's, it's, you, you, you go in Den Haag or in Amsterdam, uh, you meet civil servants obsessed about cutting red tape. You go in the Flemish administration, you meet also the same kind of no gold plating, cutting red tape, boosting investment. Okay, but uh, on the long run, um, I come back to the fifth report of the IPCC. How many increase of in temperature can we accept uh, for the end of the century? Will it be 4.5, 5.6, 6.2? And that perhaps matter much more than just cutting a few sheets of papers that need to be uh, fulfilled by uh, undertakings. Uh, Environmental lawyers did not reflect during many years upon the relationship between uh, competition and environmental law. Uh, there's uh, now more uh, writings, in particular from uh, Kingston's uh, teaching in uh, Dublin. Uh, again, uh, the relationships are not idyllic. Uh, on the one hand, a competition law uh, seeks the increase, uh, to increase the productivity of undertakings to the benefit of consumers, uh, whereas uh, environmental law is about regulating uh, impacts of uh, industrial productivity or, uh, in the future, impacts of uh, consumptions. Uh, nowadays, environmental considerations are taken into consideration by national competition authorities in ascertaining the scope of the markets for services, 
for environmental services, for environmental products, in particular in the uh, area of waste. But that technique is rather similar than other techniques <coughs> applied uh, to uh, intellectual property rights, for instance. Uh, there is nothing new under the sun. So the, the European Commission and the national competition authorities are just uh, taking into consideration the technicalities of the subject matters. But that has an impact on environmental issues on the account that the markets are quite fragmented. That means that there is a higher risk of dealing with very small monopolies that could run counter to the prohibition of abusing a dominant positions within the meaning of Article 102. Um, so just look at the waste management, management, management schemes. One is facing not uh, three or four schemes, but one is facing hundreds of schemes. And in each case, uh, each scheme is leading to a very uh, oligopolistic or monopolistic situation. That has to be addressed differently uh, from a competition uh, perspective. On the other hand, from the uh, competition law uh, point of view, uh, the European Commission is taking the view that uh, environmental concerns do not take into, must not be taken into consideration. Uh, a classical, traditional uh, economic approach uh, must uh, prevail. Uh, so environmental protection appears to be ancillary uh, to th this uh, traditional economic uh, approach. So to conclude with um, the TTIP chapters drafted by the European Commission are actually deeply inspired uh, by 50 years uh, of reflections uh, upon the conflict not exclusively between environmental and uh, free trade issues, but also uh, from the food safety conflict, the consumer protection conflict, the health safety uh, conflict. So the EU has been rife lately with conflicts opposing uh, different facets of the society uh, to this uh, economic integration model. So, but I, I come back to my uh, first comment uh, in the course of this morning is that what's we, 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 there's a piece missing uh, in the, the forthcoming machine is that uh, the TTIP is providing for room for discussion between the US and the EU. It's not providing for harmonization. So uh, I wonder whether one uh, is not making a mountain out of a molehill, whether it wouldn't be much easier to work uh, through bilateral treaties on very specific subject matters instead of embracing um, a treaty encompassing so far 23 chapters, ranging from cosmetics to pharmaceuticals. So, unfinished business, uh, that's close to my home in Brussels. Though we achieve very high level of recycling, uh, waste management is still a disaster in the capital of the EU. Thank you. Thank you, thank you greatly for sharing your uh, great expertise in this area of, uh, with us. Uh, the areas that you ranged over to those of us who've um, researched and, and taught um, EU environmental law are uh, fairly familiar, well defined. The interrelationship to Article 34 and 36, we have a body of case law. We, we feel we have a fair sense of what the exceptions are to the rule. Uh, against um, uh, uh, quantitative restriction, but maybe I've been over influenced by these guys who've been speaking earlier, the scaremongers, are they? Um, one interpretation is that Article 36 is about to be scrapped. We're going to get a whole raft of completely new bases for uh, derogation, which are going to be some sort of amalgam from the United States and the e EU. Have I misunderstood that, or is that uh, the prospect, the fear of what, what are the implications of this? Well, recurring upon former remarks, uh, I like the one about the plumber because uh, it, 
working for many uh, Belgian public and foreign public authorities, I always felt uh, to live in the skin of a plumber and trying to, to fix and to, to repair pipes, uh, institutional pipes. Well, it, it, it occurs to me that uh, so far the Court of Justice has been adumbrating 16 or 17 exemptions yeah. ranging from uh, um, pres preservation of historical and archaeological heritage yeah. uh, to uh, road safety. The chapter proposed by the European Commission regarding the TBT, the technical obstacle to trade, is actually fleshing out the TBT obligations that provides for two or three exemptions, one of which relates to environmental protection. So at the World Trade Organization, actually the, the approach endorsed by the TBT, which is a leg specialty in contrast to the uh, Lex Generalis, that's the GATT of 1994, it's a much more narrow as a matter of exemptions. So th th there is already a contradiction between what the European Commission is proposing regarding the exemptions yeah. and uh, the exemptions uh, that have been uh, acknowledged by the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. It sounds like some pretty major changes could be in, in prospect here. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but perhaps nobody has been reflecting upon, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, upon that. I just uh, improvised two weeks ago a lecture uh, in louvain la uh, on the, the chapter. Uh, uh, so many questions uh, occurred to me with respect to the consequences uh, mutual recognition could have. So let's imagine that uh, that means that all American cars complying with American standards can be marketed immediately uh, on the uh, within the internal market without, without passing new tests, yeah. which is not possible nowadays. But why there is uh, then a, a specific chapters on cars? So wh what would be the linkage? So, so there are many uh, questions that are not yet uh, resolved. Um, th this kind of questions, well, that's my view, uh, have to be discussed uh, within uh, parliamentary commissions, within um, a general uh, parliamentary assembly. The, the difficulties we do face nowadays is that these negotiations are taking place um, between closed doors and so the European Parliament uh, pursuant to Article 218 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union uh, has only the power either to approve or to reject the treaty so the, par the Parliament cannot really negotiate the treaty so the, the Council also uh, has to sign what the European Commission uh, is negotiating or asked to reject it bluntly with a major crisis expected with the USA. So, so I, I'm afraid that we won't get a public debate within a democratic assembly. Um, Whereas when, when we discuss uh, the biocide directive or the pesticide directives, of course we have 75 one MPs uh, voting I, I, I must throw this open for, for public discussion. I'm conscious that um, people want to ask questions. A lady at the back there would like to introduce yourself, Emily. Yes, my name is Emily Shirley, and I'm from the Kent Environment and Community Network. Um, I'm just wondering whether that should this TTIP go ahead in whatever shape or form it will. Uh, eventually, would it not be in breach of Article 3.3 of the TEU and also of the Aarhus Convention, the public participation requirements? Yes. Uh, <laughs> the, the obligations are set out uh, under Article 3 are, are, are so loose, are so vague that it will be difficult to review uh, the compatibility of a uh, treaty. Uh, I, I imagine that there will be a state at which a member state is going to request the opinion of the Court of Justice uh, under uh, Article 218, Paragraph 8. Um, so the, the, la the latest uh, opinion uh, on the accession of the EU to the uh, Human Rights Conventions was uh, havoc, as you know, because the, bluntly speaking, the Court of Justice explained to the Commission that uh, the Commission, in spite of having so many bright lawyers, did the wrong jobs. Uh, 
uh, in um, carving out uh, the, the accession. Uh, so I, I imagine that, that, that's, that, that will be the case. Uh, there, there will be a member state, it's perhaps not an institution, but that, uh, that can be Belgium, that can be Latvia or Estonia, uh, requesting the court to deliver an opinion. And so there, there will be then an assessment uh, of the uh, project of the treaty uh, with a number of a broad range uh, obligations laid uh, under the different uh, charter. Uh, regarding uh, the Oris Convention, that's a very smart question. <laughs> Um, regarding the the, 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 the review, um, um, it, it is an issue that been slightly touched upon by one of the early speakers. Whilst we're discussing the role of states and blocks of uh, states, um, uh, was it Ruth was saying what about or somebody from the floor saying what about the role of individuals? And whilst Ars puts this great emphasis upon public participation. Others have said, well, what's been happening? It's been uh, clouded in secrecy, and mm. uh, there does seem to be some deficit in that, that respect. But in, in, the, in, in contrast to a uh, former uh, tra treaty, it's really the, the first treaty um, coming into limelight. So there's never, in the history of the European Commission, there's never been so much transparency with respect to that treaty. <laughs> much more transparency than the CETA treaty that was mentioned. Now, actually, it was also smart of the former speaker to um, focus also on CETA because CETA is actually uh, providing for much uh, liberalization uh, and there's never been such an amount of public discussion with respect to CETA. This and is the Canadian. Yeah, that's Canadian treaty. That's not yet into force. And uh, some ratifications are blocked. Right. Time for another question from the floor. Uh, uh, Ali Nihat, uh, Peel UK committee member. Uh, Professor de Sadler, um, you mentioned the case of Cassis de Dijon uh, in your talk and also previously in some of the questions in the original TTIP panel. Um, uh, and, and you spoke about judicial activism. You touched on judicial activism within the EU. Um, you also mentioned that the, the, the court might feel its monopoly uh, of, of some sort would, w was uh, under threat and by implication it might guard it jealously. Um, I know it's always problematic making predictions about something as nebulous as, as judicial will or something as questionable as that, but if TTIP goes through in the form that we suspect it might, and that's up for question, um, what might we expect from the ECJ? What kind of behavior might we expect from the ECJ? What can it do um, in regards to TTIP? What powers would it have? It's difficult to guess in the crystal yeah. ball as the saying goes. Um, with respect to my uh, first remark, um, I was not commenting upon the um, um, action for review uh, leading to nullification. I, I was referring to extra contractual liability uh, of the EU institutions whenever uh, they act uh, impair upon a fundamental freedom. So far, uh, there is an average of 10 to 12 cases lodged by private parties before the general court of the court of justice. The latest one is a French fisherman um, rec um, engaging the liability of the European Con the Council of Ministers with respect to the prohibitions of fishing during part of the years uh, tuna in the Mediterranean. So that's bordering on investment. The fishermen invested in uh, fishing gears uh, to capture uh, tuna fishes. Uh, the Commission or the Council have been laying down restrictions, uh, unable to use the equipment, so the larger case. So I, I, I really don't know how, how that can fit into the picture with this um, court of justice obsession to say, okay, we are not going to be ruled by the uh, court of human rights in Strasbourg because we want to have the last word. Well, that's my interpretation of the uh, opinion of uh, last December. So, um, so if, if 
there is a, a, an opinion requested by a member state. I imagine the Court of Justice will have to tackle this uh, issue. But so, so far, there were no questions regarding these issues with respect to the other ISDS uh, clauses in the other agreements. So, so of course, ISDS is nothing new under the sun. But the case law is evolving. And so lawyers are more and more aware of this, the scope of ambit of this monopoly that's really restricting. Um, so no, I, I'm, I'm a li little bit at loss. So I was just, it, it came to, to me that, uh, that perhaps a, a question uh, that need to be raised and that need to be discussed. And given that there won't be a parliamentary debate, it's important that you organize. And thank you again for inviting me here, because it's, a, it's the, the, the way in which the ideas involved in the discussions are, are prompted. F final question. OK, okay well, um, let's uh, take a break. Uh, there, I'm sure um, Professor Sadler would be willing to take uh, questions uh, individually. And, and thank you very much, uh, Ruth and Professor, for your uh, talks. We'll have a, a break for lunch and reconvene. Thank you. Thank you. 